Matthew chapter 19, and we're going to read verses 1 down to verse 9. I want you to follow with me. It came to pass, verse 1, that when Jesus had finished these sayings, that He departed from Galilee, and He came to the coast of Judea, or coast Judea beyond Jordan, and great multitudes followed Him, and He healed them there. And the Pharisees also came unto Him, and notice why they came to Him, tempting Him, saying unto Him, Is it lawful for a man to put away his wife for every cause, for any cause? Now in that time and in that culture, only a man could divorce a woman. A woman could not divorce a man. And so Jesus answers verse 4 and said unto them, Have you not read that He which made them at the beginning made them male and female? And He said, For this cause a man will leave his father and mother, shall cleave unto his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. Wherefore, they are no more two, but they are one flesh. Now here's a commentary of Jesus on the book of Genesis. He says, What therefore God has joined together, let no man put asunder. Those are the words of Jesus Christ based on that text from Genesis chapter 2. Now they respond in verse 7 to Pharisees who are trying to trap Jesus. And they said, and why did Moses command? That's where they make their big mistake. Moses did not command. Why did Moses command to give a writing of divorcement and to put her away? And he said unto them, Moses, because of the hardness of your hearts, allowed, notice that he doesn't say commanded, but allowed you to put away your wives. And then notice how he ends in verse 8. But... From the beginning, it was what? Those are the words of Jesus Christ. Is it okay for a man to divorce his wife for any and every reason? And Jesus says, from the beginning, no, that's not God's plan. That is not God's design. That is not God's intention or purpose. Now, the Pharisees come to Jesus in verse 3 and they're tempting Him. And they're trying to trap Him. And they ask Him this question, is it okay, is it lawful, is it within the law for a man to divorce his wife for any and every reason? Now, there were two schools of thought about divorce at the time of Jesus. And these two schools of thought followed two rabbinical schools led by these two rabbis. The first was Hillel. And Hillel taught that a man could divorce his wife for any reason. He actually said that if a man found a woman more beautiful than his wife, he's found an uncleanliness in her and he can divorce her. If she burns his bagel in the morning or his falafel and he eats it and he feels awful after he ate his falafel, that he could divorce his wife. So the school of Hillel was very broad and very liberal and very prominent. Everyone liked Hillel. Yes, I can dig that. Yeah, any reason I want to divorce my wife. And I believe, this is a little footnote here, I believe that lax divorce laws are detrimental to our culture. I believe that lax, easy divorce laws are detrimental to our culture. I believe that we need to hold to the sanctity of marriage. That it's a sacred covenant and a commitment between a man and a woman before God and man. It's a contract and that we need to hold marriage as sanctified by God. Now we've been to all over the doctrines of marriage in the book of Genesis and we draw as well from Jesus' words here in Matthew 19. But one of the problems here, the school of Hillel was prevailing. The other school was Shimei. So Hillel, liberal. Shimei, very restricted. Based on the law of Moses in Deuteronomy, which I'll allude to in a minute, that the only reason that a man could divorce his wife was some moral uncleanliness. And in the book of Deuteronomy, the passage says that if a man finds an uncleanliness in his wife, let him give her a writing divorcement and send her away. 
So Shimei I said that's only a moral uncleanness, and it would seem to be some kind of sexual immorality. The word means uh, nakedness, and uh, we don't really know from the Hebrew what that means, but that was a very narrow, restrictive view. But the school of Hillel was prevalent. Now this is but what I want to say. Their problem was is they were focusing on divorce. They were thinking about divorce. They were, they, 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 were, they were thinking about divorce. They were focused on They were captivated by divorce. That's a bad thing. If you are a married person, you shouldn't think about divorce. You shouldn't talk about divorce. Never, ever, ever, if you're a married person, use the D word. I want a divorce. People throw that out. God takes that very seriously, and, and, and we should too. And we shouldn't be focusing on it and thinking about it and all enamored by I want to know, can I get a divorce? I want to know, can I get out of this marriage? And instead of being focused on God's laws and God's Word and God's principles and making your marriage what God wants it to be, we need to think biblically. Don't listen to the world. If I want to know what... It, uh, I want to believe about divorce. I, I don't watch the Jerry Springer show. I mean, you watch that thing, you feel like taking a bath. It's so disgusting. Which I don't know from experience because I haven't watched it. But I've caught it going through, you know, on channel server. And it's like, oh my goodness, this is insane. I don't watch the Oprah show to find out what I should believe about divorce. I, I don't want to listen to the you know, people at work or around the drinking fountain or my best friends. I want to turn to the Bible and know what God says about the subject of marriage and divorce. And so Jesus says to them who are trying to trap Him, do you follow Hillel or do you follow Shimei? Is it okay to divorce your wife for any and every reason? He answers and says to them, and I love it, verse 4, have you not Red. Isn't that cool? Jesus said, here's your problem. You're not reading your Bibles. Have you not read that He which made them at the beginning, quoting Genesis 1.27, male, made them male and female. And by the way, Jesus believed that marriage was one man and one woman. Circle the word male and female. That's marriage as Jesus defines it. So I'm going to stick with Jesus over the Supreme Court of the United States. If Jesus believed it, I believe it. He's the one who created and designed marriage. And then He said, for this cause a man will leave his father and mother, cleave to his wife, and they become one flesh. Genesis 2, verse 24, the foundation of marriage, leave, cleave, one flesh. They're no more two, but they're one. Therefore, what God has joined together, let no man... Put asunder. Then you come to verse 7. Then you come to verse 7. And this is where it gets interesting. If I were to paraphrase it, I would paraphrase, aha, we got you. They were trying to trap Jesus. And this is kind of an aha moment. Aha, we've got you. And they were trying to pit Him against the law of Moses. They go, why did Moses then command to give a writing of divorcement and to send her away. They really thought that they had trapped Him and that they were going to be able to get the popular opinion against Jesus because He's speaking against Moses. Why did Moses command to give a writing of divorcement and to put her away? Now, we're going to come right back to this text, but turn with me to Deuteronomy chapter 24. And I want you to see it from the pen of Moses. Deuteronomy 24, and begin in verse 1. When a man hath taken a wife and married her, and, it's fa and, and she find no favor in his eyes, because he hath found some, here it is, uncleanliness, or literally nakedness, or exposure for her, then let him write her a bill of divorcement and give it in her hand, and send her out of his house. And when she is departed out of his house, 
she may go and become another man's wife. She can remarry. But if, now I want you to circle that little word if, or take note of that word if in verse 3. So this is kind of a hypothetical scenario. If the latter husband hate her, the second husband she marries, and he writes her a bill of divorcement and gives it in her hand and sends her out of the house, or if, here it is again, a latter husband die, which hath took her to be his wife. Here's the point Moses is trying to make. The former husband which sent her away may not take her again to be his wife. After that she is defiled, for it is an abomination before the Lord. Thou shalt not cause the land to sin which the Lord thy God has given thee for an inheritance. The purpose of this law of Moses was that they would not be able to divorce and remarry. Divorce and remarry. Divorce or remarry. Or if a guy was going to divorce his wife, and then uh, later on, he thought, no, she really was a good cook. i got to get her back. And he tried to get her back, and that would defile the land. You're not to be divorced, remarry, divorce, remarry. And some people go into marriage kind of like that. They go into marriage with the idea, you know, if it doesn't work out, then I can just, you know, find somebody else. And if that doesn't work out, I can find somebody else. I heard the story of a woman that wanted to marry four different men. She said, because there's four things that I need most. So she wanted to marry a banker. She wanted to marry a movie star. She wanted to marry a clergyman. And finally, she wanted to marry a funeral director. This is a joke. And someone asked her, why would you want to marry these four different men? She said, one for the money, two for the show, three to get ready, and four to go. Now, that's a funny look at a not-so-funny subject. Some people just peel through marriages like they're disposable. And they carry scars for the rest of their life. Now, I'm not, I'm not going to focus on the, the, the hurt and the pain of divorce. It is, I believe, some of the, the greatest, if not some of the greatest pain I've ever seen. It's, it's, it's a horribly painful situation. And there's no doubt many of you here tonight in a crowd this size that have been divorced. And you know the pain. And God loves you. He's never left you. He doesn't forsake you. Uh, he's a friend that sticks closer to the brother. You can never do anything to cause him to not loving you. So you have God and you have his love. And God will see you. Many of you not, didn't want divorce. And it wasn't your design. It wasn't your purpose. Or maybe you were young and you made some mistakes or before you were saved. And I'm going to talk about that at the end of my teaching tonight. But Moses here, I want to give you some facts about the law of Moses before we go back to what Jesus said about divorce. Moses only gave one commandment, and that was that the divorced wife could not return to her first husband if she was divorced by her second husband. So Moses did not command divorce. He did not require a divorce. He did not recommend a divorce, nor even sanction a divorce. He was only giving guidelines to control divorce and remarry. So that was not the thrust of his legislation here. The law of Moses would do two things. The husband would think twice before hastily putting away his wife since he couldn't get her back. And he would take time to find a scribe and, 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 and he would have to write a bill of divorcement. And then maybe he would cool down and perhaps he would seek to be reconciled to his wife. The law of Moses was. And here's what I believe to be a great definition of divorce in God's economy. And that is, it is a divine concession to human weakness. Or a divine concession to human sin. That God knows our weaknesses. He knows our sin. And so God allows it as we're going to go back and see in Matthew 19, because of the hardness of our hearts. So Moses is not commanding anybody to get a divorce. Go back with me now to Matthew chapter 19. 
So Jesus responds in verse 8. And Jesus says, Moses, because of the hardness of your heart, a divine concession to human sin. That's what divorce is. And Moses only allowed you, not commanded you, to put away your wives because your hearts were hard. I believe the only reason why two Christians would ever end up in divorce is because of the hardness of hearts. In this word hardness, here we get our word sclerosis from it. Sclerosis of the heart. And if one or both in the relationship harden their heart, there's no hope. This is why I tell couples, guard your heart from sclerosis. Never harden your heart toward God. Always keep your heart tender and soft and say, God, soften my heart. Help me to be sensitive to sin. Help me to fear You. Help me to want Your will in my life. Help me to love my husband. Help me to love my wife. Soften my heart, oh God. Don't let me listen to the world. Don't let me listen to the ideas of the world. Don't let me listen to the lies of the devil. If you're a married woman, Satan has all kinds of lies to tell you about your husband. If you're a married man, Satan has all kinds of lies to tell you about your wife, you know. You'd be happier with someone else. You could find somebody that would meet your needs better. Uh, this guy's a bum. He's a louse. He do, you know, you don't deserve that. You deserve a better. And it's the devil, the devil, the devil, the devil, the devil. And you need to recognize its source. And you also need to recognize that we live in a culture that is extremely narcissistic. It's absorbed with self. It's self-focus. Self-awareness. Self-fulfillment. It's all about me. I've got to be me. I've got to find me. I've got to do what's good for me. I have to be happy. And so many people bail out of their marriage way too early. Way too early. I've never met anyone that said I should have, you know, got out earlier. I think that we need to wait on God. We need to trust God. We need to hope in God. But we're going to see that Jesus gives an acceptance clause. Jesus answers the question, said God only allowed you to do this because your hearts were hardened. So guard your heart against a hard heart. Don't listen to the world. Actually, it was back in 1979, so quite a long time ago, excuse me, 1982, an issue of uh, New Woman magazine, which claimed more than 8 million readers, and I quote, it says, yes, your marriage can wear out, people change their values and lifestyles, people want to experience new things, change is part of life, change in personal growth or traits that you should be proud of, indicative of a vital searching mind. And he says, you must, they say, the article says, quote, you must accept the reality that in today's multifaceted world, it is especially easy for two persons to grow apart. Letting go of your marriage, if it is no longer good for you, can be the most successful thing that you've ever done. Getting a divorce can be a positive, problem solving, growth oriented step. It can be a personal triumph. Boo is right. That's a thumbs down quote. But that's the world. That's what the world is saying. As Christians, we should march to the beat of a different drummer. God wants what's best for us, and we need to be so careful. Don't be polluted by the world or listen to the world. I know there's rough times in marriages, but you just... You just got to listen to God. Don't, don't harden your hearts. Don't harden your hearts. This is not God's original plan, verse 8. If we believe that marriage is a divine institution, then we can also trust God to help us to fulfill the purpose and the design for marriage. The higher our concept of marriage and the family, the more devastating the experience of divorce is. And it's very important that we have a high standard of marriage. Now, what did Jesus teach about divorce? It's in verse 9. Jesus said, I say unto you, whosoever shall divorce, put away his wife, except 
This is what's called an acceptance clause. Except it be for fornication, and she'll marry another. In other words, you divorce, it's not for sexual immorality. You marry another, then you are committing adultery. And whosoever marries her, which has been divorced or put away, commits adultery. And the disciples, read verse 9, they said in him, if this is the case with the man with the wife, man, it's good not to, to marry. The word man's not in there. I just threw that in there. They're like, whoa! Whew! I think it's a good idea not to get married if this is the case. Now when Jesus said, I say unto you, I believe that that is a claim of Christ to be God, that only God can establish and alter the laws of marriage. And so Jesus is saying, I say unto you, now, the one exception is fornication, sexual immorality. Now, let him, now let, let me say this about this acceptance clause. Number one, I do believe that it should be accepted and is authentic as an utterance of Jesus. And I say that because there's a lot of Christians and Bible scholars that say because the acceptance clause is not found in Mark, and because the acceptance clause is not found in Luke, only in Matthew. They don't believe it's legitimate, but there's no reason to believe it's not in the text of Matthew. There's no reason not to believe that it's in the text of Matthew. That it should be viewed as an authentic utterance of Jesus. Now, divorce is allowed for sexual infidelity. The word fornication is a Greek word, pornea. And I've mentioned it before. The word pornea means sexual immorality. What is sexual immorality? It's sex outside of marriage. So if you're single and you have sex with somebody you're not married to, that's pornea, that's fornication, that's sexual immorality. Now there's not a marriage situation there, but it's still sexual immorality. And if you get married and you have sex with someone other than your married partner, we call them an affair. Sometimes we call it a fling or whatever the terms are today. God calls it sin. We use the word adultery. We use the word adultery. But pornea covers adultery. Fornication is for sex before marriage. Adultery is sex outside your marriage relationship. We talked about sexual intimacy last week. The only place that you as a married person or any human being can have sex is in the covenant relationship of marriage. A husband and wife. Husband and wife. Husband and wife. If you're married, there's only one person that can meet that need in your life, and that's your spouse. So when you go outside that, now, people all want, they always want to know, does pornography uh, come under that cover and, 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 and out of the things? I'm not going to go there. I have my ideas, I have my convictions, I have my views. But Jesus did say, I will throw this out, He said, if you look lustfully or longingly after someone, you've committed adultery in your heart. But I want you to note something. I'm, I'm going to go there, but this acceptance clause, Jesus isn't commanding you to get a divorce. He's not saying that you should get a divorce. He's saying that you're allowed to get a divorce. It's an acceptance clause. It's not a command. So we need to be careful that we don't uh, view it as, well, I get to divorce you and I'm glad and I want a divorce. And we try, to, we, we try to focus on divorce rather than focus on restoration. Divorce for sexual immorality is permissible, but it's not mandatory. Jesus is not teaching that the innocent party must divorce, nor that it is mandatory. And the truth is, only the innocent party has the allowance in the acceptance clause to divorce the other individual. It's interesting when Joseph found out that Mary, the mother of Jesus, was pregnant, he was going to put her away privately because he did love her. His heart was broken, but he was going to put her away. They were on the, the period of a spousal. But the preferable action to take is to seek reconciliation. Now, 
I realize that there's again situations where the guilty party doesn't repent, isn't sorry, uh, doesn't come back to God, doesn't ask for forgiveness, and uh, is continuing in their sin, then divorce is allowable. It's not still commanded, but it is allowable. And there's a fine line there. You don't want to facilitate or encourage a sexually immoral married partner by allowing them to go and come and to go and come and to play around and do whatever they want. I've often counseled people, you need to draw a line. You need to say, I, I, you know, this is dishonoring to God. It's sin. And God doesn't want you to do that. He doesn't want me to put up with that. And you draw a line and, and you give them an ultimatum. How long do you wait? That's between you and God. I can't tell you how long to wait. But I've seen marriages restored. There have been forgiveness. You need to remember it's God's will to reconcile. It's God's will that your heart be softened and changed. You need to turn your heart back to God. You need to pray that God will soften the heart. If you're the guilty party, you need to face your sin, your selfishness, honestly, and confess it before God. Humble yourself and repent and turn back to God. Surrender the Holy Spirit. Ask Him to fill you with His Spirit. I've seen a lot of marriages where there's been infidelity and the guilty party has been sorry and truly repentant and the innocent party has forgiven them. And there's been restoration. I do believe there's scars there. And it's awful hard to trust somebody that violates your trust. This is why I always tell people, never violate trust. Never violate trust. Because once that's violated, it's almost impossible to regain or to be restored. Now, let me ask some questions. You say, well, what if you divorce for the wrong reasons? And maybe it was before you were saved. Well, then ask God to forgive you. Divorce is not an unpardonable sin. Divorce is not an unpardonable sin. Is there any sin that the blood of Jesus Christ cannot cleanse? Answer, no. There's no sin for what the blood of Jesus Christ can forgive. You say, well, is, that, is that a license to have an affair or to commit adultery or to be unfaithful in my marriage? No. Shall we continue in sin that grace may be abound? Paul says, God forbid. But I do believe that God can forgive divorce. Second question I was asked is, what if you have remarried after divorce that had no scriptural grounds? Should I get another divorce and go back to my previous wife? No, 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 no. Don't be stupid. I emphasize that because I've actually heard preachers tell people to do that. If you got a divorce and you got remarried and you realize you didn't have grounds for a divorce, get another divorce and go boing back. Stupid. Let every man abide in the calling where he's called. Repent, get right with God, realize you did a stupid thing, but God forgives you, and God will lift you as high as you allow Him to lift you. God will bless you as much as you allow Him to bless you. Walk in obedience. Ask God to fill you with His Holy Spirit. And God will bless you in spite of the damage that is done and the effect it has on your children, on family, on other people. The chain reaction of divorce is just is tragic. How detrimental it is to children. How detrimental it is to you as your own sight. Physically, economically, emotionally, spiritually. And a lot of times people think that it's the easy road to take and then realize all the pain and the hurt that it brings about. Now, here's my third question. What if you're married to an unbeliever and they're not pleased to, to be married to you? This question leads us to what Paul says about divorce and what I believe to be in a second biblical basis for divorce. Go to 1 Corinthians chapter 7. 1 Corinthians chapter 7, and begin with me at verse 10. Paul says, I, And unto the married I command, yet not I, but the Lord. Let not the wife depart from her husband. And if she does depart, let her remain unmarried or be reconciled to her husband, 
let not the husband put away his wife. Then verse 12, he says, but to the rest speak I, not the Lord. Now all he's doing is saying that Jesus didn't address this issue in marriage. He's not saying that these words are not inspired by God. He's just saying Jesus didn't speak about this, but I have the mind of Christ. I'm writing under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. So he says, the rest speak I, not the Lord. Verse 12, if any brother has a wife that believes not, and she is pleased to dwell with him, let him not put her away. And the woman which has a husband that believes not. In other words, you have a spouse that's not a Christian. You get saved after you're married, and maybe you get saved, but your husband or wife doesn't. It happens all the time. You're not to divorce them if they're pleased to dwell with you. And if you be pleased to dwell with her, let him not leave him. But notice verse 14. For the unbelieving husband is sanctified by the wife, and the unbelieving wife is sanctified by the husband, else your children were unclean, but now are they holy. In other words, the believing spouse has a Christian influence, a sanctifying influence on the unsaved spouse. Now, if you're not married, you shouldn't choose to marry a non-Christian. You should not be equally yoked with an unbeliever, unequally yoked with an unbeliever. But if you get saved, married, and your husband or wife are not saved, you don't go, man, I want a divorce now because you're a heathen, or I want to get cooties, and you don't love Jesus and I do, so I want out of this marriage. <laughs> See you later. You don't do that. This is something that people constantly come to me with. My wife's not a Christian. My husband's not a Christian. My wife's not a Christian. My husband's not a Christian. Uh, what do I do? Pray for him. Fix them some really good meals. Be a good wife. Be a good husband. Submit to them. Be a godly example to them. Let them see what God has done in your life and win them by your love and your submission. Read 1 Peter chapter 3. He talks to wives who have unsaved husbands. You go, well, I, I, want, I want a Christian husband. There's a couple of them at Revival that I got my eye on. There's this one guy with this really, really nice Bible. I think he's, he'd be really a good husband. Any man that carries a Bible like that's a, a man for me, you know. No. You don't do that. You don't dump your husband because he's a heathen. You're the Christian influence. You're the sanctifying influence on him and on the children. But then he says something quite amazing in verse 15. But, here's the but. If the unbelieving departs, underline the word depart, let him depart. A brother or sister is not under bondage in such cases. But God has called us to peace. He says, For what knowest thou, O wife, whether thou shalt save thy husband? Or how do you know, O man, whether thou shalt save thy wife? Now what does he mean by if the unbeliever depart, let him depart, you're not under bondage in such cases. I can make it pretty simple. There are two biblical bases for divorce. The first is pornea, sexual immorality. You have a biblical basis for divorce. You're not commanded to divorce. You're not encouraged to divorce. But if you must divorce and it's necessary, you can divorce. And you're free. And wherever God allows divorce, I believe He allows remarriage. Especially on this innocent party side. God doesn't expect you to stay single the rest of your life. Here's the second reason that God allows divorce. Abandonment. A unbeliever abandons you, does not want to be married to you because you're a Christian. Wants out of the marriage it's not what you want, but they abandon you, they leave. You are free to divorce and remarry. Years ago, I had a woman come to me just crying, and she said, Pastor John, it's been eight years. My husband left to go shopping somewhere and, and literally never came back. He never came back. And it's been eight years. Do I have to stay single the rest of my life? 
Do I have to stay unmarried the rest of my life? I read her this verse. I said, you are free to remarry. Now, I'm not there to tell her what to do. Yes, divorce her. If you want to pray and wait, and maybe he'll finally see the light come back. I, I don't know. But if he abandons you. Now, that doesn't mean you send him to get milk some night, and then you look at your watch and go, praise God. He's been gone 15 minutes. I'm, thank God I'm free at last. The word depart speaks of a permanent abandonment. It speaks of a permanent abandonment. I know it becomes a challenge to, to be able to define what it means to be abandoned. I think as Christians, we should do all we can to pray and to wait. But if you've got an unsaved spouse or even a professing Christian spouse that is backslid and wants out of the marriage, I think it's okay to let them have their desire. If you want out of the marriage, I'm not going to force you to stay in this marriage. I'm not going to compel you to stay in the marriage. You can go and you can get a divorce and you can remarry. A brother or sister is not under bondage. And the word bondage is the same word used for the marriage bond and the marriage relationship. Now, let's flip back to Matthew chapter 19 and wrap this up. You say, well, Pastor John, I'm not married. Well, number one, it's good that you learn what the Bible says about divorce. Because I already read it. Notice verse 10. The disciples said to him when they heard Jesus speaking about divorce, they said, if this is the case with a man, it's good not to get married. They were going to do the bachelors to the rapture. This is the bachelors to the rapture club as it first started. And then he said unto them, verse 11, all men cannot receive this saying, save to whom it is given. Not everyone can handle the idea that I'll never get married, I want to stay single. For there are some eunuchs which are so born from their mother's womb, and there are some eunuchs which are made eunuchs of men, and there be eunuchs which have been made themselves eunuchs for the purpose of the kingdom of heaven. Sake. He that is able to receive it, let him receive it. Now you can also continue to read back in 1 Corinthians 7. There's a lot of instruction there for, un, for un, unmarried people. But, but let me just say this if you're unmarried. Number one, God's will for your life is purity. You say, well, I've already blown that. I've already messed up on that. Okay, then ask God to forgive you. The blood of Jesus Christ cleanses from all sin. God will forgive you. And He will separate your sins as far as the east is from the west. The second thing you need to do is not only live pure, but you need to be slow. Don't rush into marriage. Now I know that there's people that see each other a few months later, boom, they're married and they live married for a long time. Those are very rare. I think it's better to to practice patience and prayer and see that person in all different kind of situations and, and take your time. Don't be in a big rush to get married. Once you're married, you're married. Duh. Pastor John, will you marry us? Pastor John, will you? Okay, how long have you been known? So oh, we've known each other for three weeks. No, I will not marry you. That is just stupid. Slow down. Take your time. Make sure this is the right person. And every time you see a red light, don't be stupid. Every time you see a red light, put on the brakes. Back up a little bit. Well, he's got this problem or he's got that problem. But I know that once we get married, I can fix him. We know how that works, right? Or she's kind of this, or she's kind of that, but you know, that's all right because she's really pretty. Take your time, use the wisdom that God gives you, and don't rush into marriage. For what God has joined together, let no man put asunder. Now, I know that probably in a lot of ways, I've probably opened up a can of worms. 
And let me, let me reiterate. Number one, sexual immorality, you have a biblical basis for divorce. Abandonment, you have a biblical basis for divorce. If you were divorced before you were saved and you got saved, the Bible says old things pass away, behold, all things become new. God creates you brand new. Forgetting those things which are behind, I press toward the goal for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. Don't let the sins of the past hold you down from running the race into the future. The beautiful thing about Jesus and the Gospel is that He's able to create you brand new. He's, pre- he's able to make people brand new. And He does forgive any sins. There's no sin too great but what He forgives. They brought a woman caught in the act of adultery and they said, Moses commands that she should be stolen. What do you say? And at the end of the story, Jesus said, let him that has no sin cast the first stone. And as they all trickled off and she was standing alone with Jesus, I can imagine tears running down her face. She was guilty of sexual immorality. Jesus said with great compassion, He said, where are your condemners? Where are your accusers? Hath no man condemned you? And she said, no one, Lord. And then Jesus said these wonderful words. He said, neither do I condemn you, but go and sin no more. What a marvelous truth that is. God not condemning you. He forgives you, but go and sin no more. Amen?